Hi, welcome back. We're talking about uh, lifespan development today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, growth and development is something that we all get excited about. In utero, we're excited to follow the baby's development with ultrasound and other testing. As babies take their first steps, the first word, the first everything, we look forward to growing and developing. We're learning more and more about human development all the time. And when I was starting out, I'm a developmental psychologist, there weren't any human development courses really. It was just development. And it ended in early adulthood. And there were no real possibilities, at least in my program and others that I had looked at around the country, um, to take anything in adulthood. Uh, but now, fortunately, we know much more. We know we continue to develop throughout our entire lives from, from conception to uh, death. Um, and uh, we, are, we have a whole field now that's dedicated to looking at aging and development past uh, the point of puberty. So um, the field is full of research. Um, we have all kinds of new findings now uh, that are always developing. This is a great um, field because there's so it's so rich with information and we continue to um, uh, find out new things with all of the new research that's out there. So what is developmental psychology? It's a field of study that examines physical, cognitive, and socio-emotional changes across the lifespan. Physical development starts as soon as the sperm and egg unite, and it continues until we die. Maturation is based is bio-based change that follows an orderly pattern. And it is the physical growth beginning with conception and ending when the body stops growing and developing. This is the same across cultures and ethnicity. So I have a video to show you. I'm going to post it on course units. Um, so please pause the lecture now to watch the video. This is a video that is real and shows graphic images at the end with a birth. Um, so just be aware. But it's a great video because it takes you from um, uh, the very moment of conception all the way through birth. So let's start now. Now that hopefully you've watched the video, uh, you've paused it, you've come back, and now you're uh, starting back. Um, let's talk about chromosomes and genes. To make a complete person, we need 46 chromosomes. That's 23 from dad and 23 from mom. So if you've heard of 23 and me, maybe that'll help you remember that you need uh, 23 and 23 to make 46, okay? So again, that's 23 uh, chromosomes from dad, 23 chromosomes from mom, and that makes 46 chromosomes to make a complete person. Chromosomes are inherited thread-like structures composed of DNA, and every cell in our body has a nucleus at its center. In the nucleus is the blueprint for building the complete person. So throughout this lecture today, I'm gonna to be showing you a lot of images and um, sharing my screen a lot. So get ready for a lot of back and forth. I just think it's gonna be a little bit better than if I, um, uh, put a lot of the, the material up on course units and you have to keep pausing and going to take a look. So with DNA, each chromosome contains one molecule of DNA and the DNA provides the instructions for the development of an organism. So I'm gonna share my screen here and show you the image that I'm looking at because I think this is going to be helpful. So what we're looking at here is, um, this is, most of you have probably seen this, this is DNA. Uh, what we're looking at here are the base pairs. Um, and I will come back to a lot of this, but I wanted you to see what DNA looks like, what a picture of DNA looks like. So let's go back.
and a gene. Um, a gene is a specified segment of a DNA molecule. So let me take you to that if I can. So let's go here. I'm going to share screen and show you this. Okay, so what we have here is this is the DNA. So this looks, it's a smaller version of what you saw before, right? Um, the DNA. So this is the DNA. Within the DNA right here, this is the gene. So as you can see here, this is the gene. So um, it's a part of it. So that's what um, was meant by that. So you got to see the bigger picture before of DNA. Now you're getting to see uh, what, a, what would make up a gene right there. Okay, so let's go on. A zygote is a single cell formed by the union of a sperm cell and an egg. And the zygote has 23 pairs of chromosomes. So it'll be 46 in, in total. This includes instructions to develop into a male or female, depending on whether there is an XX for female or an XY for male pair of sex chromosomes. So, when we look further into that, we know that there's a genotype, an individual's complete collection of genes. Genotypes do not change in response to the environment, but they do interact with the environment. So some examples are the color and appearance of your skin. There is an interplay with your genotype and the sun wind, your age, nutrition, smoking, which can all impact how your genes are expressed. And this interaction is called the phenotype. The phenotype is, is the expression or characteristics of one's genetic inheritance. So um, I have freckles when I go out in the sun. So I have very pale skin. My genotype is to have very pale skin. When I go out in the sun, freckles come out. That's, my, that's a phenotype. So this is an observable characteristic and it has an interplay with the environment. So that is an example of that. And most of you will be able to probably come up with examples of how, what your genotype may be um, and how the um, environment can interact with that. If I, I'm very pale, but if I go into the sun, eventually I will get a little bit of a tan. And so that is the phenotype. That's the expression of um, my genetic inheritance. Epigenetics is the field of study that examines the processes involved in the development of phenotypes. So an example is studying schizophrenia. A person's genotype may predispose them to getting schizophrenia. There is a 60 to 80% heritability rate for this, but environment may play a role in this, uh, like diet, stress, toxins, and childhood adversity all play a part. Just like freckles for me when I go out in the sun, um, that can be the case with the environment having an, uh, such as diet, stress, toxins, and all of that. Um, having an effect on somebody who's predisposed to um, uh, uh, getting schizophrenia. Studies of identical twins have shown that even though they have the same genotype, they may display different phenotypes, including the expression of schizophrenia. And this is due to the relationship between the genes and the environment. So most people don't think of mental health as something uh, that could be. Um, uh, the same as uh, uh, a visual expression change, but in fact it is. Dominant genes, one of a pair of genes that has power over the expression of an inherited characteristic. So that would be curly hair, brown hair, brown eyes. And recessive genes, 
one of a pair of genes that is overpowered by a dominant gene. A recessive gene cannot overcome the influence of a dominant gene. For example, curly hair is dominant, dark hair, um, uh, widow's peak, all those sorts of things are all uh, dominant. Um, recessive genes are the ones that are like blue eyes, blonde hair, straight hair, those sorts of things. Monozygotic twins are identical twins. Think of mono as one. They develop from an egg inseminated at conception. They share a hundred percent of their genes. Dizygotic twins are fraternal twins, and that means that there are two eggs that are inseminated by two different sperm, leading to two zygotes. They are just like any other biological sibling, sharing 50% of their genes. So it's, it's like if you have a sibling, it would be like being born at the same time as your sibling. Um, an embryo is the unborn human from the beginning of the third week of pregnancy, lasting through the eighth week of prenatal development. And the fetus is between two months and birth. Uh, the growing baby is the fetus. So maturation ends when we stop physically growing, but physical change continues. The physical changes aren't necessarily positive. For example, in our 40s and older, we may need reading glasses like I have here. I didn't need them until I was in my 40s. Memory changes start to happen in the 40s. And as early as our 20s or 30s, we can't perform as well in sports activities as we could when we were younger. There are debates in developmental psychology about things like nature and nurture, stages and continuity and stability over change. And basically, these refer to us not agreeing on and needing more research to answer the questions. One, do we, need, do we develop in discrete stages or is it a con continuous process? Two, what is the role of heredity and environment? Three, can, personal, can personality change over a lifetime and across situations? So what do you think about that? <clears throat> What are your thoughts? Any ideas? Let's start to look at heredity versus the environment. What about all the twin studies? There are similarities uh, among twin, twins, but they're not the same. And can personality change? This is a debate and no one knows the answer yet. This is something that you can research. Uh, this is still an open field. Um, there's still debate about this. Um, and for continuous versus stages deba debate, um, there are developmental changes. Um, is it stage or is it continuous? Um, the, you know, that is still um, out for debate as well. So um, give this, these some thought while we talk about this um, chapter. And um, you think about the way you, you would, what, do you, what is it that you would think about this? So some of the theories to talk about, one of them is Piaget and cognitive development. And um, I'm just gonna go through some of his stages that he has because there's a description about Piaget in the book. Um, but Piaget believed that there were, um, cog that he looked at cognitive development. And he believed that um, this, there were stages, the first one being the sensory motor stage. And this is zero to two years old. And in this stage, it's um, looking at um, object permanence. So how often have you ever gone and seen um, a baby um, who's young um, and you uh, play peekaboo and you go, peekaboo, peekaboo. Um, you know, when you're hiding and they can't see you, it's like, where are you? And then they see you. Uh, no one at this age is surprised if someone does this and then they come back again. The same with if you were to hide, if I were to hide over here and you can't see me and I come back, uh, you're not surprised. Babies are, and this is object permanence. Uh, 
if uh, they can't see you, you're not there, that kind of a thing. So it's really cute to see um, with little babies and how they develop that. But at, at about two years of age, they would know that if I go here or if I hide behind uh, the wall be in the other room, that I'm still there. I didn't go anywhere. I'm just in a different place. The next stage is pre-operational, and this is from two to seven years of age. And this is um, looking at a, an egocentric stage. And what we're looking for is the conservation failure. So let's talk about what that is. Um, uh, the, the perspective of the child is very egocentric, very focused on themselves. They're not able to take the perspective of somebody else when they're looking at something. So if you are shown a, a three-dimensional object and uh, the child is talking to you about it, they're not going to know that you can see that you're seeing something completely different from them. There's another, <coughs> another part of it, and let me see if I can draw it out for you. That might be useful. Um, is conservation. You may have already heard of this, but let's just go ahead and um, and see if we can, I can give you a little description here. So, if I show you a glass with some liquid in it, and excuse my drawing, I'm not an artist, uh, you have liquid in a glass here. And then you, in front of the child, between two and seven, <coughs> pour that liquid into this container this taller, thinner con container. What do you think the child, what, do you think that the child will think that it's the same amount of liquid in here? That it has more or that it has less? What do you think? In fact, they think there's more in this one because it's taller. The same thing can happen if I have Um, I'm going to just draw it out. If I have five quarters, right, and I have another row of five quarters below it, I'll say, are these the same? And the child will say yes. Now, if I were to draw it like this, let me, give me a minute to draw. If I show it like this, and I even move it in front of them to move these quarters to separate them a bit, and I say which one has more, the child will say this one. Even though they saw you uh, move them and they saw that there were the same number as there were before, that you didn't take any away or you didn't add any, they'll still say this one. And that's because of... Um, the failure to conserve. So this is um, the, in the pre-operational stage. Now, when they're able to say, okay, these two have the same amount and these two glasses have the same amount, then they've reached that stage. The next stage is the concrete operational stage. And that's between seven and 12 years of age. And this is when you're able to do reversible manipulations. So um, you're able to see things from another person's point of view. You can conserve. Uh, you're able to see that, in fact, those were the same number of quarters and the liquid that was poured from one glass into a taller, thinner glass is the same amount of liquid. And finally, formal operations is 12 and older. And this is abstract thinking. You don't need um, a concrete example for things, for uh, formal operations. Um, you're manipulating ideas. So uh, this would be like physics, things like that, the arts, those sorts of things. There's no real concrete um, uh, uh, explanation that is um, example that's needed. So Piaget is good um, for rational thinking, but um, he doesn't really talk about emotional thinking and development. 
And this led to the idea of everything being at the sta same stage, but it's not. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of what's involved. There's a schema. And this is a collection of ideas that represents a basic unit of understanding. And the things that are involved in a schema are assimilation, accommodation, and equilibrium. So let me just say that again, a schema is a collection of ideas that represents a basic unit of understanding. So let's, let's move on. Assimilation. That's using existing information and ideas to understand new knowledge and experiences. So assimilation refers to part of the adaptive um, adaptation process that's initially proposed by Piaget. And through assimilation, we take in new information and experiences and incorporate them into our existing ideas. So an example would be that a child has pets in her home, small dogs. And when she sees a large kitten at a neighbor's house or a large cat at a neighbor's house for the first time, she may call it a puppy because it has many of the similarities to the dog that she has. So she applies her unfamiliar small animal to her already existing knowledge base or schema. Accommodation is a restructuring of old ideas to make a place for new information. Accommodation refers to part of the adaptive uh, adaptation process and the process of accommodation involves altering your existing schemas or ideas as a result of, as a result of new information or new experiences. So a, a young child may have a, an existing schema for a dog, but it can uh, change when that comes in. So let me give you an idea though that is more, um, more relatable to regular everyday life. So let's just say you are sitting at your table and um, it's dinner time and your whole family is sitting around the table having dinner. And then you hear a knock on your door. And um, let's just say there are four people at the table and you're all eating and you hear a knock, 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 knock. And it's some person you haven't seen in a while. They happen to be in the neighborhood. And um, they said, hey, I was just in the neighborhood. I thought I'd drop by and say hi. And you say to them, you know what? Come on in. We were just sitting down to dinner. I will accommodate you and set a place setting for you and get some food for you. And you can come sit at the table. We're all used to accommodating um, people and situations. And that's really what we're talking about here with regard to learning. You're taking what you already had existing, your already existing schema for having dinner, someone else comes in and you say, come on, bring this new information in and we'll just put you at the table. Now we have five at the table. So, that's how I like to think of accommodation, that you all know what accommodation is, you do it all the time. So you can think of it that way. So assimilation and accommodation both work in tandem as part of the learning process. And some information is simply incorporated into our existing schemas through the process of assimilation, while other information leads to the development of new schemas or total transformations of existing ideas through the process of accommodation. And equilibrium, um, this is where Piaget believed that cognitive development did not progress at a steady, at a steady rate, it wasn't continuous, but he believed that it um, went in leaps and bounds. So equilibrium occurs when a child's schemas can deal with most new information through assimilation. So new information comes in and you've assimilated it, you've, it's, it's now part of your learning, and now you're in a state of equilibrium. It's kind of like homeostasis. Now you're, if you're at a comfortable level. Then something new comes in and you assimilate that. You're doing that every time you learn, all right? You're assimilating new information in, and then when you know it, you're comfortable. You're, you're at equilibrium, and then more information comes in. That's how that works. So um, I'm gonna... Um, 
pull up for you a video that I'd like you to watch on Piaget's stages of development. I'm going to share my screen for you. New babies aren't quite sure what happens to objects when they leave their sight. Sky's mom keeps disappearing and reappearing. No wonder peekaboo is so much fun. During their first year, however, infants will learn an important concept, object permanence. Everything has a life of its own, even if it is out of sight. At Maya's age, babies know to look for the object, but they might not have everything else straight. Ten-month-old Simon is about to make a classic mistake. Although he watched us place the toy plane under the white cloth, he'll look for it where he last found it, not where he watched us hide it. Can you look at these two glasses? Do you think that they have the same amount of juice? Do you think they have the same? Okay. Now we're going to pour this juice into this glass. Now, do you think that this glass has more juice? This glass has more juice? Or do you think that they have the same amount? That one has more. This one has more? And why do you think that this one has more? Because the, it's taller. Okay, you ready? Okay. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters? Or do they have the same? One, two, three. <clears throat> one, two, three. Four, five. One, two, three, four, five. They're the same? Five, five. Okay. Okay. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more or do they have the same? This one has more. That one has more quarters? Why does this row have more quarters? Because it's more like more like um far away. It's far it's more far away? Yeah, like it's like more far away than like that. All right, we're gonna play a game with the graham crackers and we're gonna share them between me and you, okay? Okay. Do you think that we shared those fairly? No. No, why not? We shared. You have those and I have this one. Well, what about, what, what if we try this? This one right there? Okay. Now is it fair? Yeah. Yeah, why is it fair now? Because we both have two. Can you tell me what you see when you look at that from where you're sitting? What are some of the things that you see? Um, a cat. A cat. And a tree and a bone. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing. Can you tell me what you see when you look at it from that stool? Um, an owl. An owl? And what, what's What is that? Uh, a goat. A goat? Okay, is there anything else you see? Yeah, right there. Right there, what is that? Uh, a tree. A tree. And that's another little tree. Another little tree? Yeah, right. And can you tell me what I see when I look at this from where I'm sitting right here? So we're going to look at these two cups right here. Do you think there's the same amount of juice in this glass as there is in that glass? There you go. Okay. So we're going to take the juice from this glass and pour it into this one right here. Okay. okay so now we're going to look at this glass and that one. So do you think that there's more juice in this glass? more juice in this glass, or do you think that they have the same amount? Same amount. Okay, why do you think that they have the same amount? Just because this is skinny doesn't mean it, 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 doesn't, 
it's not the same amount. Uh, it, it has the same amount of juice in it, but it this one is just wider and this one's skinnier, but they have the same amount of juice in it. It says, if you hit a glass with a hammer, the glass will break. <laughs> and then this one says, Don hit a glass with a hammer. I knew that too. So what happened to the glass? It broke. It broke. Why did it break? Because the hammer's hard. If you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. No, it won't. And this is the second rule. Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened to the glass? Nothing. Nothing happened? Why didn't anything happen? Because there's several stuff. If you hit a glass with a feather, the glass will break. And the second one, Don hit a glass with a feather. What happened to the glass? It broke. And why did it break? Because it says, if you hit a glass with a feather, it'll break. So if you hit a glass with a feather, it broke. Okay, so I hope that was helpful and gave some examples of what we just went over. Um, I'm going to move on here and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Vygotsky and cognitive development. Uh, so let me just see if I can get this up for you. I'm going to show you a Vygotsky video before I talk about it. So let's just pull that up. I'm going to share my screen again. Vygotsky argued that learning impacts development. With early math, for instance, learning skills can hasten development. Rather than viewing this early counting as just rote reciting, Vygotsky would argue that it nudges a child towards a concept of the symbolic nature of number. Children construct knowledge. Learning can lead development. Development cannot be separated from its social context. Language plays a central role in mental development. Vygotsky envisioned a more complex relationship between development and learning than either the young Piaget or the elderly Pavlov had conceived. As we will see, Vygotsky gave great value to assisting children to use strategies to further their intellectual capacities. The next time we count them, I'm going to help you. Okay. Put your finger out and we'll count each one. It is in this context that we will discuss the best known part of Vygotsky's work, the zone of proximal development. Point to each one close to the bear and count loudly. One, two, three. But when the teacher structures the activity differently, the same child can perform at a higher level counting meaningfully to 17 without missing any bears. 15, 16, 17. Great job, Gwen. The area between the level of independent performance and the level of assisted performance is the zone of proximal development. It is here where the teacher must focus attention. Lev Vygotsky was born about 100 years ago in 1896 in Tsarist Russia. As Jews, the Vygotsky family, however prosperous, were outsiders in Russia under Tsar Nicholas, to limits on how many could be formally educated. The odds were great, but miraculously Vygotsky gained a place. He also became interested in psychology and began to research in this field. He also managed to write seven books and dozens of articles before dying at age 37 in 1934. For Vygotsky, 
The social context influences more than just attitudes and beliefs. It has a profound influence on how we think as well as what we think. Bogotsky and his colleagues witnessed the rapid social changes in the Soviet Union that occurred when non-technical cultures did to participate in the quite technically advanced Western culture of the new empire. Bogotsky's work reminds us of the processes necessary for children to regulate their own internal and external behavior. Encouraging children to draw what they are experiencing, to talk to each other about it, to write about it, and even to talk to themselves about it, enables them to move towards being independent learners. Good job, Alex. So, Vygotsky saw children as little apprentices who receive help from older children and adults to improve their cognitive abilities. So, <clears throat> an example is when a parent helps a child solve a puzzle, like a regular puzzle, by supporting them to help them succeed on their own rather than doing it for them. And this helps them advance in their goal-directed behavior and helps them to learn to plan ahead. There's something called scaffolding, and this is pushing children to go just beyond what they're, comp what they're competent and comfortable doing while providing help in a decreasing manner. And the zone of proximal development is the range of cognitive tasks that can be accomplished alone and those that require the guidance and help of others. So we as adults can help a child move from a basic project to a more complex project by supporting and guiding them. Vygotsky believed that learning occurs differently ac across cultures because there are different learning expectations. Also, he did not focus on emotional development. So let's talk about some other important concepts in our development. I'm going to pause it here and I'm going to come back in just a moment. So let's pause here. Okay, so let's talk about some important concepts in our development. There's a critical period, and this is a specific time frame in which an organism is sensitive to environmental factors, and certain behaviors and abilities are readily shaped or altered by events or experiences. One example is geese. Conrad Lorenz in 1937 found the imprinting phenomenon. So um, when baby geese hatch, they become attached to the first moving um, and sound emitting object they see. So whether or not is, it is their actual mother, uh, they will imprint. So Con Conrad Lorenz uh, made sure that he was the first moving creature baby Gosling saw after hatching and they followed him around as soon as they could stand up and walk and they became permanently attached to him. He found that experiences during a critical period result in permanent irreversible changes in brain function. Humans don't have such dramatic behavior changes, but some researchers believe there's a critical period for language, vision, attachment, and um, an example of this is in humans, when we've seen kids who have been deprived early on, uh, we see that there are some um, lags or um, that there are just some cutoff points at which uh, they do not develop in terms of language and other areas. And Jeannie Wiley is an example of that. She was considered a feral child who was found in 1970 and she was severely deprived her whole life and at age 13 had stunted language. She was taken away from her deprivation and studied extensively. Her brother, who was raised in the same house and uh, he was not deprived, had none of the issues that Jeannie had. He developed normally. And they both had the same intelligence level. Everything else was the same, except that she was deprived and he was not. And this led to psychologists understanding critical periods for language. 
And <clears throat> I'd like to show you a video about this. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Officials in the Los Angeles suburb of Arcadia have taken custody of a 13-year-old girl, and they say was kept in such isolation by her parents that she never even learned to talk. The girl still wore diapers and was uttering infantile noises. A social worker discovered the case two weeks ago. But the authorities are hoping she still may have a normal learning capacity. Among the first to see the child was Temple City Detective Sergeant Frank Lindley. much bigger than my daughter Beverly who had just turned seven about three months earlier and I really had a hard time conceiving of the idea that the child was the age that she was. The child uh, obviously had been severely mistreated after she was still in diapers, couldn't walk, but she had no verbal skills at all at that point. The last time I was on this street was probably 30 years ago. Yep, there it is. Hasn't changed much. The backyard looks the same. It's all weeds and dead grass. Looks the same as it did in 1970. The house belonged to Clark Wiley. A loner, Clark had turned his back on the world after his mother had been killed in a hit and run accident. After the accident, things in the Wiley house would never be the same again. The house was completely dark. All the blinds were drawn. There were no toys, no clothes, nothing that would ever indicate to you that a, a child of any age lived there. The child's bedroom was back in this corner. That was the bedroom. The uh, windows were covered to about three inches from the top, which was the only natural light that had ever come in there and all the time the child was in the bedroom. The entire furnishings of the bedroom consisted of a cage with a uh, pull-down chicken wire uh, lid and some type of piece of wire securing it when they closed it down. There was a potty chair with some kind of homemade strapping device. For 13 years, Jeannie had spent her nights locked in bed, her days strapped to a potty chair. During that time, Clark had ordered his son John and wife Irene never to talk to her. In her darkened room, she had led a life of near total isolation. Even close neighbors were completely unaware of her presence. We came home from work and the police was here and they came to question us. That's when we found out, you know, what happened and, uh, you know, that they had a little girl. Nobody knew, nobody knew before. And when we found out what happened, how she was treated, I mean, everybody was shocked and just unbelievable. For their whole marriage, Clark had imposed his will on Irene. And blind with cataracts, she had been too scared to resist. But one day, something broke. While Clark was out buying groceries, she seized her chance and fled. It was the first glimpse the world would have of Clark and Irene's dark secret. I met Clark and Irene at Temple City Sheriff's Station. They were both under arrest at the time. When we interviewed Irene, uh, she would make no mention of the family whatsoever, particularly the children. I attempted, along with my partner, to interview Clark. He refused to talk to us. He wouldn't say a word. He never even acknowledged that he understood what we were talking about. Mr. Wiley? Yes. Why did you keep your daughter in the room? Mr. Wiley has no comment. no comment. We haven't had time to discuss the charge. We haven't even seen them. Unable to face the truth, Clark took matters into his own hands. Morning, the authorities reported that 70 year old Clark Wiley shot and killed himself just before he was to go to court to be arraigned for child abuse. After 13 years, Jeannie was at last free. And for scientists, she was just the case they had been waiting for. For 13 years, Jeannie had lived a life of complete isolation. 
Raised in a city bedroom, Jeannie was as much a feral child as if she had been brought up by wolves. At 13, she was the size of a six-year-old. Worst of all, she had never been taught to speak. The question now, could she ever learn? Jeannie's case was so scientifically important that the government funded a team of scientists to help answer the many questions she posed. Two of the scientists who would become especially important to Jeannie were child psychologist James Kent and linguist Susan Curtis. Neither had ever encountered a case as extreme as Jeannie's. her as, uh, a, as a newborn in a way, even though we know she had, she came with 13 years of, of memories and experiences, not all of them wonderful, most of them not, I think, and so we thought we needed to start to expose her to what the world was going to be like for her outside the hospital bed. To Jeannie, everything was a new experience. Do what you would do with, with your own kids, if you're reducing them to the world, you take them out and hold them up and show them <laughs> sort of judge from how they reacted to whether this was too much or not enough and you could move on and do the next thing Jeannie was making amazing progress as the experts looked on they realized that she might be the answer to the question that had troubled science for so long so we seized this wonderful opportunity that she provided us in as loving a way as we could but using it to finally get our chance to address head-on specific hypotheses and notions about human language and the human mind. These hypotheses were based on the latest ideas about how children's brains developed. According to the theory, young children could only learn certain things at certain times, called critical periods. Language was one of these critical periods, and according to the theory, Jeannie, who was now a teenager, had missed her chance forever. But incredibly, Jeannie seemed to be proving the theory wrong. As this footage shows, Jeannie was blossoming. Not only was she delighted by the world around her, but she was learning the words for the new things she was seeing. She was extremely interested in everything around her. She wanted to know the word for everything around her. She wanted to engage people all around her. She was not mentally deficient. Her lights were on and everyone who worked with her, from teachers to therapists to me, knew that she was not retarded. It was the clearest day. And as she began to learn more and more words, hundreds of words, much more rapidly, than I ever imagined, and stringing them together, I began to think maybe I will be wrong. Maybe she will be the one that will prove that this hypothesis is incorrect. But Jeannie could not escape the effects of her past so easily. She was still haunted by her traumatic upbringing, trapped by the memories of the awful fate she had suffered. And linguistically, she had stopped making progress. She learned tons of words. She has an enormous vocabulary. But language is not words. Language is grammar. Language is sentences. How do you make a sentence? What can be a sentence? What is a sentence? How do you automatically know something's a sentence? So it wasn't because she was cognitively deficient. In other respects, it was because she was cognitively deficient in this island of human mind, the mental faculty that we call grammar. At the time Jeannie was found, brain science was in its infancy. But today, we have a much clearer picture of what actually happens in cases of extreme neglect like Jeannie's. In Jeannie's brain, the, the left part of her her brain, the, her cortex, that, that has those neural systems responsible for speech and language, because she never heard any words and because she was never talk, spoken to very often, they didn't get stimulated. And because they weren't stimulated, they got s smaller and less functional and disconnected. And ultimately, that part of the brain literally physically changes. Today, with modern imaging technology, we can actually see what happens in the brains of feral children. And the effects are shocking. 
Without normal stimulation, their brains are smaller and malformed. And the earlier this neglect begins, and the longer it carries on, the worse the damage will be. Starved of stimulation, Jeannie's brain had simply not developed the capacity for language. And now that she was a teenager, she would never be able to learn. Despite this, Jeannie continued to be a close part of everyone's life. But there was more trouble up ahead. Children have to belong to somebody when they grow up, and she was still a child, and she needed a family to belong to. So that's what we would have liked, a family that she could belong to. Uh, and that's not what happened, unfortunately. What did happen is about the worst outcome um, I think we would have envisioned. On her 18th birthday, Jeannie moved back with her mother, Irene, into the house in which she had been so terribly abused. But after only a few weeks, it was clear that Irene couldn't cope. From here, Jeannie was moved into state care with terrible consequences. I was a student, and people wouldn't listen to me. People who needed to intervene did not listen to me. And so I spent lots and lots of time on the phone pleading with people to intervene and save this person who had had the worst experience of deprivation and isolation in all recorded medical history. Jeannie moved from home to home, sometimes with the very people who served as her therapists. This potential conflict of interests raised tensions among the many people involved in her life, and a tug of war erupted over the child. As Jeannie's condition deteriorated, Irene decided that Susan Curtis and the other academics had become too close to Jeannie. A lawsuit followed. I went from being asked to be her guardian to one week later being prevented from seeing her or phoning her. And ever since then, I've been prevented from having any contact at all. So although I have lots of, you know, the, I'm still a scientist, I'm still interested in knowing things about her language now and all kinds of interesting things I would like to pursue academically. Primarily, I would just like to see her. Now, a ward of the court Jeannie lives in an adult care home somewhere in Los Angeles, prevented from seeing the people who once meant so much to her. Okay, so <clears throat> this shows critical period in human beings and particularly with language. I wanna really stress that um, this was not something that was just an unusual case. Again, she had a brother named John, John Wiley, who was not deprived as Jeannie was, and his development was normal. It was typical, unlike his sister, whose development was stunted, and they both grew up in the same house. So I would like you to see this video of her brother talking because it'll show you the difference in language development. Officials in Los Angeles suburb of Arcadia have taken custody of a 13-year-old girl and they say was kept in such isolation by her parents that she never even learned to talk. Her elderly parents have been charged with child abuse. It was a family that once was that fell apart. <laughs> um, after times gone by and I put a family together and you know, I, I don't have the hurt that I used to have. And I'm uh, happy for my sister for getting all the attention she's gotten and all the help, professional help. Mm -hmm. They weren't very educated people. Uh, they weren't outspoken. They didn't mingle with people. It's just, and I have a little resentment for that. The fear of my upbringing not being uh, what I expected it to be. I mean, at that point in time, I didn't know what to expect. Okay, but later in life, you know, I would have expected a lot more from my parents than what they gave me. They didn't give me the tools of knowledge to get out and feel comfortable uh, about accomplishment and setting goals. They didn't teach me about uh, the Bible and its teachings and, uh, and God. I didn't really know there was a God. I feel like at times that God's failed me. And... Uh, Maybe he has, and, and maybe he hasn't. You know, I'm alive to, you know, to, 
I've enjoyed a lot of things. God's given me that. You know, God hasn't really failed me. I might have failed him since, you know, I've let all this time go by. But uh, it's never too late. So as you can see, he has, um, he has normal language. He doesn't have any um, stunted language development. Um, and so that's the difference between someone who is denied um, uh, any kind of stimulation. Uh, there's a critical period that we know for language uh, that you can't um, obtain it afterwards, just like um, the Goslings who followed Conrad Lorenz, um, they realized that uh, that was irreversible at some point. Uh, so at any rate, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about other aspects of critical periods that were studied by Harry Harlow, who researched love, but later became seen as attachment. We now call what he was calling love attachment. And he did this uh, work in University of Wisconsin laboratory. And what he did was he aimed to illuminate the relationship um, Sorry, there's um, a lawnmower outside. He aimed to illuminate the relationship formed between infants and mothers. And he showed that mother love was emotional rather than physiological, showing that nurture is important in determining a healthy psychological development, more so than nature. Just providing food and necessities to grow is not enough. So there needs to be an emotional component to that. And he showed the capacity for attachment was closely associated with critical periods in early life, <clears throat> after which it was difficult or impossible to compensate for the loss of initial emotional security. And the critical period thesis confirmed the wisdom of placing infants with adoptive parents as shortly after birth as possible. Harlow's work provided experimental evidence for prioritizing psychological over biological parenthood while underlining the development, developmental risks of adopting children beyond infancy. And so um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and show you this video. I'm going to share my screen again. separated from his mother since the day of his birth. Literally, his life hangs by a thread, a soft cheesecloth pad that is his only companion, his only comfort. Once a day, the pad is removed for cleaning. This is the laboratory of psychologist Harry Harlow. Troubled, distressed, permanently deprived. He is studying monkeys to better understand human relationships. May die for want of love. Harlow believes he can use science to study love. With a series of pioneering experiments, he explores territory where few scientists have ventured. Harlow said that there was such a thing as a science of love, for example, that love, the kind of intimacy that characterized relationships between mothers and infants, although in his case he studied monkeys, um, could be the object of science, that you literally could move love into a laboratory, put it under a microscope. Harlow is studying love because he believes it makes an indelible impact on a young life. The relationship between a mother and her child, what Harlow calls our earliest social environment, could hold the key to explaining behavior throughout life. Harlow designs a set of ingenious experiments. He raises a baby monkey, allowing it to choose between two surrogate mothers, a wire mother that feeds it, and a cloth mother that doesn't. A cloth mother that Harlow thinks might provide something else comfort, and love. Here's baby 106, weaned on a wire mud. He's going to the wire mother. But this infant quickly runs to the cloth mother, where he will
will stay for the next 18 hours cuddling. In Harlow's mind, choosing nurturing over sustenance. In another experiment, Harlow creates a fearful situation. Whom does the infant turn to now? Let's find out what his reaction to his mother are when we fight him. He's scared, all right. And he does what any child will do in a similar situation. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. something about the experience of comfort and love, even more than food, that seems crucial to all these monkeys. But what happens when the infant is raised alone, without any mother at all, wire or cloth? In this situation, the orphan monkey stays alone. He won't even go to the cloth mother, frightened, but retreats into his own world. Harlow believes he has shown how want of love can damage an infant for life. And he worries the same is true for people. What comes through loud and clear in Harry Harlow's experiment was that the early experience and the environment were crucial to the healthy development of, a, of the infant child. And that in a sense, if you messed up, if the right kind of maternal presence was not there during the critical years, then that infant might grow up to be an adult incapable of forming healthy relationships with other kinds of people. So that shows um, the critical period for love um, and forming attachments. Um, so let's talk a little bit about attachment. Um, Spitz um, talked about institutionalism. And he observed children in institutions to see how they coped with depriva deprivation of their caregiver. And what he found was that children become increasingly depressed when deprived of their caregivers uh, during a three month period. So depression was um, partial at first, but became more severe and is called hospitalism after three months of deprivation. This showed the babies who were well taken care of materially, but who lacked a caregiver, became lethargic, depressed, and even died. So um, what we also know is that um, other people studied uh, all kinds of areas like Bowlby uh, said that we're pre-wired that nature is involved, uh, to have a connection of the um, child with the primary caregiver, which is, you know, in, in the times that he was studying, this is usually mom. Nowadays, it's dad, it's grandma, it's whoever, but really it's just the primary caregiver. And that um, there's a desire for proximity to an attachment figure um, and a sense of security for um, the attachment figure is present and that there's a sense of distress when the attachment figure is absent. So he believed that there's a, an evolutionary reason for this, and that is to stay alive. And so his studies focused on that aspect of attachment. And I'm gonna share my screen with you to go ahead and show you another quick video clip to Our help you with this. longing is to have stable, satisfying relationships. But the painful fact is that very large numbers of relationships have one painful episode after another, or seemingly intractable, miserable conflicts running through them. It's one of the biggest questions there is. Why is it so hard to be happy in love? The huge and not yet fully digested insight of psychoanalysis is that the challenges of relationships always start when we were children. It was the contribution of a great English psychoanalyst called John Bowlby to trace the tensions and conflicts we have with our partners back to our earliest experiences of maternal care. His ideas are sound in part because he drew so deeply and honestly on his own experiences in order to formulate them. Born in 1907, Bowlby had a quintessentially upper-class British childhood. Young Bowlby hardly saw his parents and was looked after by a nanny who was let go when he was just four, leaving young Bowlby bereft. 
At seven, he was sent off in line with the conventions of his class to boarding school. He hated it and later declared, I wouldn't send a dog away to boarding school at the age of seven. Bowlby became a brilliant medical student and an imaginative researcher. When he was a consultant to the World Health Organization in the early 1950s, Bowlby wrote a report, Maternal Care and Mental Health. He attacked prevalent assumptions and argued that kindness doesn't smother and spoil children. It's as if maternal care were as necessary for the proper development of personality as vitamin D for the proper development of bones, he wrote. This insight initiated a wave of reform. The visitation rules of many health institutions were reformed to allow parents to stay with their children, where they'd once been allowed only to visit and never touch. It sounds like a dry bureaucratic move, but it ended countless afternoons of quiet sorrow and evenings of solitary anguish. In a book published in 1959 called Separation Anxiety, Bowlby looks at what happens when there isn't enough of this kind of parental care. He described the behavior of children he'd observed who'd been separated from their parents. If the child is separated for too long, they still crave the attention, love, and interest of the parents, but feel that anything good may disappear at any moment. They look for a lot of reassurance and get upset if it's not forthcoming. They become volatile, they take heart, and then they despair, and then they're filled with hope again. This is the pattern of what Bowlby called anxious attachment. But the degree of separation from the parents may lead to another sort of problem. The child could feel so helpless, they become what Bowlby called detached. They enter their own world to protect themselves and become remote and cold. They experience what Bowlby calls avoidant attachment. That is, they see tenderness, closeness, emotional investment as always dangerous and to be shunned. They may in truth be desperate for a cuddle or for reassurance, but such things look far too treacherous. The focus of Bowlby's thinking was about what happens to a child if there are too many difficulties in forming secure attachments. But the consequences don't magically get restricted only to the age of 8 or 12 or 17. They're lifelong. Our attachment style is fed by our earliest experiences. It's a pre-existing script that gets written into our adult relationships, usually without us even realizing that this has happened. In line with Bowlby's views about how children relate to their parents, there are three basic kinds of attachment we can have to other adults. Firstly, secure attachment. This is the rare ideal. When you're securely attached, if there's a problem, you'll work it out. You're not appalled by the weakness of your partner. If your partner's a bit down, confused, or being a bit annoying, you don't react too wildly. Because even if they can't be nice to you, you can take care of yourself and have hopefully a little time left over to meet some of the needs of your partner. You give the other the benefit of the doubt when interpreting behavior. You realize that maybe they had a tricky time at work. That's why they're not so interested in your day. The explanations are accommodating, generous, and usually more accurate. But there's another kind of attachment, anxious attachment. And this is marked by clinginess, texting and calling all the time just to check where the other is and keep tabs on what they're up to. You need to make sure the other person hasn't left you or the country. Anxiously attached people become coercive and demanding and focus on their own needs, not their partners. Anxious attachment involves a lot of anger because the stakes feel so high. A minor slight, a hasty word, a tiny oversight can look to the anxiously attached person like huge threats. They seem to announce the imminent breakup of the whole relationship. One feels, the reason you don't tell me that the minestrone soup I made is delicious is that you don't love me and are planning to leave me, when the true explanation may simply be that one's partner is mulling over a very tricky bit of news about a contract at work. Avoidant attachment means that you would rather withdraw and go away than compromise, get angry, or even just get close to another person. If there's a problem, you don't talk. Your instinct is to say you don't need the other person, especially if you're lonely. Avoidant spouses often team up with anxious ones. It's a risky combination. The avoidant one doesn't give the anxious one much support, and the anxious one is always invading the delicate privacy of the avoidant one. Bowlby helps us to feel more generous and more constructive about what these partners are doing when they upset or disappoint us. Almost no one in truth is purely anxious or purely avoidant. We're just a bit like that some of the time. So, alerted by Bowlby, we can see that a partner's apparent coldness and indifference is not caused by their loathing of us, but by the fact that a long time ago they were probably rather badly hurt by intimacy and it opens possibilities of self-knowledge which can help one reform, if only a little, one's own rather eccentric behaviour.
So I hope that this was helpful in um, showing uh, Bulby. Um, there, he wasn't the only one who studied attachment patterns. Mary Ainsworth also did, and she looked at something called the strange situation. And in this research that she did, she had a young child um, and a mom who were, who were in a room together. Then she would have mom leave, and then a stranger would enter the room, uh, and then the mom would return. And they wanted to see what the baby would do. And in cases where the baby had a secure attachment, the baby would welcome mom back. In an anxious attachment or ambivalent attachment, uh, the baby was angry and rejecting, but also wanted to be close to mom. In an avoidant attachment, the baby would ignore mom. And in a disorganized attachment, the baby would just freak out. So um, the idea is that, and we saw that in the video, that this um, pattern can last. Um, so that this is something that can uh, carry into adulthood. So um, what we do know that is good to know is that about 60% of people are securely attached. Um, about 25% are avoidantly or anxiously attached, and 10% are ambivalently attached, and about 5% are disorganized. So um, the next thing I want to um, talk about is Erickson and the life stages that he proposed. So Vygotsky and Piaget focused on physical development um, Erickson focused on psycho, psychosocial development. So he went beyond age 12 and looked at the lifespan. He broke it up into eight stages. In each stage is a developmental task to be seen as an opportunity or a challenge, what pro, which provokes a crisis. So there are um, two outcomes. One is that you reach the stage and the other is that you don't and you're kind of stuck at that stage. Um, development um, keeps moving forward as you keep um, progressing through each stage. So at each stage, there's a developmental task to be accomplished. And this task provides a crisis. So let's go through these. Um, stage one is trust versus mistrust. And in this stage, this is birth through one year. And this is um, basically what he's saying is that in order for an infant to trust, um, her caregivers must attend to her needs. And this is like Harlow's monkeys. If the caregivers are not responsive, she'll develop in the direction of mistrust, always expecting the worst of people. So this is the time when um, the infant is learning to trust caregivers. Stage two is autonomy versus shame and doubt. And this is one to three years of age. And in this stage, the child will learn how to be autonomous and, under, un, and um, is undefended if allowed to explore. So the, the child is allowed to go out on their own and explore. And if not allowed or punished, uh, he will likely feel shame and doubt. So um, this allows the child to move beyond caregivers to family members and to close friends. And this is from one to three years of age. The next stage, stage three, is initiative versus guilt. And this is from age three through six. Children have more experiences beyond close family and friends that prompts them socially. They may become more responsible and capable of creating and executing plans, initiating a play date or activities with others. If a child does not have responsibilities or cannot handle them, she will develop feelings of guilt and anxiety. And the next stage um, is uh, stage four, industry versus inferiority. And this is age six through puberty. 
And in this stage, children are engaged in a variety of learning tasks. And this is a stage where self-esteem increases and children feel a sense of accomplishment. They're seeking out goals for themselves, music, sports, academics. And if success is not achieved, the child feels a sense of inferiority or incompetence, theoretically leading to unstable work habits or employment later on. And stage five is ego identity versus role confusion. So this one is puberty through the 20s. Um, and the idea is that this can actually, th these stages can, are a little bit broader, especially getting to this stage five. It's a little bit more flexible in the ages, so it can go beyond the 20s. Um, and this is when people try out new roles and emerge with a strong sense of values, beliefs, and goals. It's finding your identity. And um, lacking a solid identity leads to experiences of withdrawal, isolation, or continued role confusion. The next stage, stage six, is intimacy versus isolation. And this is around the 30s to 40s, and it could obviously go on into the 50s. And this is when we create meaningful, deep relationships. We're no longer looking for casual acquaintances. We don't have time for that in this age group. And if we don't reach this stage, we live in isolation. So it, what they're really saying about intimacy versus isolation is that when you're younger, you're trying out new things, you're finding out who you are, so you're going to have maybe a lot of acquaintances, maybe a lot of superficial friends, and you have time for that. When you're in your 30s and 40s and even into your 50s, um, you are looking for deeper relationships, meaningful ones that um, aren't as casual because, first of all, there's not enough time for that. Usually people are... Um, really busy with work, um, really busy with family. And so to, to fill your spare time with superficial friendships isn't um, as pleasurable. So people are looking for something more, you know, fewer friends, but more meaningful friends. So they're going to shed some of the superficial friends, but keep some of the really good closer friends. Um, and so that's what is really going on in that stage, stage six. Stage seven is generativity versus stagnation. And this is middle adulthood. And this is the desire to make a positive impact on the next generation. This can be through parenting, community involvement, mentoring, volunteering, philanthropy, some type of work or outreach that is valuable and significant. So we're choosing our legacy at this point. And this is when we're saying, hey, what have I done? What, what is making my life or the whole life that I've lived to this point meaningful? And not reaching this stage um, um, experience leads to boredom, conceit, selfishness. I refer to this as the Ebenezer effect from Ebenezer Scrooge. He seemingly had everything. He um, was a self-made guy. He lived in a mansion, he had servants taking care of his needs, but he was unhappy. He was selfish with his possessions and his emotions. And it wasn't until he reached the stage of generativity um, and where he was um, looking to actually give back to others that he experienced joy. And finally, stage eight is integrity versus despair, and this is late adulthood. And this is a feeling of a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction, that life has had meaning, um, that you can reflect and say, I don't have any regrets. Not reaching this stage is, a, uh, is having a feeling of re regret and dissatisfaction with life. And so this is where I'm gonna leave you today. Um, and I hope that you'll take a look at the videos that you need to take a look at for the journal. And please um, take a look at the video by Laura Karstensen, um, Older People Are Happier. That's one that you can also take a look at that is um, applicable to this um, talk and it's good to watch now after this video because it's a it's talking about older adulthood. So um, I'll see you next time.